I will give a reading of the Our Father through the insights of the fathers of the church. It is, uh, quite frankly, impossible to do justice to the depths of the Lord's Prayer and the wisdom of the church fathers in such a brief presentation. So what I hope to accomplish then is not to give an exhaustive or definitive interpretation of the prayer, but rather to provide you with an introductory reading and to point you to some resources for further prayer and study. I will begin with a brief introduction, which I will present the text of the Our Father in the scriptures, followed by an introduction to the fathers of the church and their importance for Christians, who they are, and why we should read them. And then finally, I'm going to give a general reading of the prayer through a series of questions and quotations from the fathers themselves. And I hope this will be fruitful and hopefully uh, we'll get some questions and point you in some directions for your own reading and prayer. So let me just share something with you here. Now we are all, of course, familiar with the Our Father. We pray it every time we celebrate Mass, uh, every time uh, we pray the Rosary, and of course, in personal prayer as well. And it is the prayer of Christians because, of course, uh, they, it is the words of our Lord himself. However, we, because we're so familiar with it, I think we often forget just uh, how strange, perhaps, this prayer is if we really begin to look at its wording and uh, what it draws us into, into the life of the Spirit. So what I would like to do here is to just help us to begin by reminding us of what we are actually praying. And I'll begin with this quote from St. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, martyr and bishop from the third century. He says this about the Lord's Prayer. How great, dear brothers, are the mysteries of the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer. How many, how magnificent, gathered together in a few words, yet abundant in spiritual power. Now, when we look at the Lord's Prayer, oops, we should remember that, in fact, we are talking about two different texts in the scriptures. Uh, there are two versions of the prayer, one in the Gospel of Matthew and one in the Gospel of Luke. I have given a very literal translation of both versions of the prayer here, each of which differ from that which we would be praying in, ma at ma in Mass or in the Rosary. I'll just go through it briefly, just so you can see that some of the points in the actual Greek text uh, don't come through in translation for us and open up more questions. Matthew's version, our Father who are in the heavens, let your name be hallowed. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our, and notice I put multiple words here, the Greek epiousios, which is the Greek word here, is unique. Uh, it's difficult to translate. I've put some of the possibilities, daily, future, or supersubstantial bread. And forgive us our debts, as we too have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation or trial. The word perosmos here in Greek can mean either one. But rescue us from evil or the evil one. Uh, it depends on whether it is neuter or masculine in the Greek. Then if we look at the version in Luke, we see that it is shorter. Uh, notice no hour. Father, let your name be hallowed. Let your kingdom come. Give us our daily, future, or super substantial bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves are also forgive each one who is in debt to us, and lead us not into temptation or trial. So notice, when we consider the text that the fathers of the church will be reading, uh, they're dealing with two different versions, and often in the original language with certain nuances that we may not be aware of in our English versions. 
It's just a little bit about the texts of the Our Fathers in the scriptures. Next, as I said, the reading I will offer uh, is not from simply my own thoughts, but rather from the figures that we call the Fathers of the Church. Now, who were the Fathers of the Church? The Fathers of the Church, we can say, were the first Christian theologians who were renowned for their wisdom and sanctity. And uh, we're talking about figures roughly from the first six or seven centuries. They are our fathers in the faith. They were laity, priests, bishops. Most of them, the vast majority, are saints recognized by the church. The, their writings come from a variety of genres, treatises, homilies, letters, apologetics, defenses of the faith, histories, and the languages in which they wrote, uh, particularly Latin and Greek, but also other languages such as Syriac and Coptic, really Egyptian language. Some of them are very well known. I'm sure all of you have heard of St. Augustine or perhaps St. Gregory the Great, but others such as Gregory of Nyssa, or St. Peter Chrysologus, or St. Maximus the Confessor, less known, and yet uh, all significant contributors to the church's theological and spiritual growth in these centuries. Now, why read or look at the Our Father with the aid of the fathers of the church? Why, in other words, read the fathers well, what I would suggest here is that we read them because, to borrow a phrase, the fathers did theology on their knees. They never separated their theology, their writings, from their own prayer, from the fruits of their own prayer and their pastoral work. In fact, really, we should say that their writings are always stemming from their prayerful and scholarly reading of the scriptures, never losing sight of the word of God and the message that it has for all of us in all times in the church. And so reading the Our Father with them is particularly fruitful for us even now. It opens up, as I said, the strangeness of the prayer that draws us into its depths. Now, as we go into my reading uh, with the fathers of the prayer, I'd like to offer an image which perhaps can unite the questions that we are about to see. And that image comes from perhaps, I say perhaps, one of the oldest commentaries on the Our Father. What you see here is uh, a called a Sator Rota square. We have many examples of it from antiquity and the Middle Ages, the oldest being uh, from Pompeii. So since that was destroyed by a volcano in 79 AD, uh, it, it certainly predates that. You'll notice, you don't have to know Latin to notice that this is what we call a two-dimensional palindrome. That is, you can read it uh, backwards and forwards, up and down, two different directions. The Latin itself, uh, sator, sower, or farmer, a repo, uh, perhaps a name, it could be a name, it's not actually a Latin word, tenet, uh, holds, uh, opera, uh, in this case it would be uh, accusative plural, works, and rotas, uh, accusative plural, wheels. If we want to translate it, perhaps the, the farmer or sower, a repo, has wheels for his works, uh, perhaps a plow. The phrase itself doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot, though very interesting the way it's formed. However, it was of interest to Christians because in addition to being a two-dimensional palindrome, it is also uh, an anagram and a pictogram. That is, we can unscramble the letters here and get other words and also a picture. 
Notice when we unscramble all the letters in the square, we get uh, pater noster, which means our father in Latin, in the form of a cross with that N as the linking point. And the remaining letters, A and O, uh, twice, are replacements for the first and the last Latin replacements for the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha and omega, which, of course, refer to God as the beginning and end of all things. And so in a way, I'd like to use this image that this square offers us, and you will find this square in churches, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, uh, ancient period, uh, offers us a kind of image of the Our Father, in which I will organize our questions and answers from the fathers. That is, with the image of the cross in Paternoster, Our Father, uh, we can say that the prayer speaks to us of salvation in Christ the cross. And then with the alpha and omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, God as beginning and end, it speaks to us of our beginning and our fulfillment in God. So the prayer speaks of our salvation in Christ, the cross, and then in turn, it speaks to us of our beginning and our end in God, the alpha and the omega. So let's begin our reading. First, salvation in Christ. Two questions that the fathers ask about the Our Father, and I'm only drawing on actual commentaries by the fathers on the Our Father for these answers, questions and answers. Uh, one question that they ask, whoops, go back here. And we should ask ourselves regularly is how can we dare to call God Father? Right? When we think about it, uh, the creator of all things, we as creatures, human beings, dare to call God Father. At the heart of the Fathers of the Church, Church's answer, we find this theme of divine adoption, one which we, of course, encounter in the scriptures themselves. For instance, in this quote from the letter to the Ephesians, he destined us to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Uh, we have in Christ been adopted as sons and daughters of God, sharing in the very divine life, and given in Christ this privilege of calling God Father. This takes place in what the fathers call the admirabile commercium, the, we could say, miraculous exchange. One way that this is expressed is God became man in order that man might become one with God. Uh, Peter Chrysologus, St. Peter Chrysologus, in the 5th century, he was bishop in Ravenna, uh, wrote this regarding the Our Father. And what is so surprising, if Christ consecrated humans as sons of God, when he gave himself and formed himself into the Son of Man? He carried the nature of the flesh into the divine when he brought divinity down to human nature. In the incarnation, in God becoming flesh, humanity is joined with divinity. And in this union in Christ, we human beings become those sons and daughters of God. This takes place, of course, in baptism. And again, the fathers, in their commentary on the Our Father and when we call God Our Father, uh, stress the significance and importance of baptism. 
in looking at this theme of baptism here and speaking to those who are to be baptized, John Cassian, uh, a monk who brought Eastern wisdom to the West, uh, Western monastic tradition, wrote, when therefore we confess with our own voice that God and Lord of the universe is our father, we profess that we have in fact been admitted from our servile condition into an adopted sonship. And this is something we should remember every time we say those words, our father. In turn, the fathers emphasize one other aspect of what we say in the prayer. In Matthew's version, of course, we say our father, pointing to the fact that our divine adoption is also an adoption into the communion of saints. Uh, Theodore Mopsuestia, a bishop uh, in the well, fourth, fifth century, uh, wrote this. I do not wish you to say my father, but our father, because he is a father common to all in the same way as his grace, from which we received adoption of sons, is common to all. In this way, you should not only offer Congress things to God, but you should also possess and keep fellowship with one another because you are brothers under the hand of one father. Our salvation in Christ is not kind of individualistic thing in which we just curl up in satisfaction in on ourselves, but rather whenever we make this expression of father, we always say our, uh, to remind us that we are part of the communion of saints in this great gift of salvation we have in Christ. Sorry, you missed a slide here. Next question that the fathers ask is, what does it mean to pray for God's reign? I mean, we next ask, we ask for, may your kingdom come. What do we mean when we say that? And how is that linked to our salvation, this reading in salvation? Well, when the fathers look at that petition in the Lord's Prayer, uh, they link it, of course, to thy will be done. That is, the coming of the kingdom is linked to the conforming to God's will what they call a divine synergy, a working with the will of God. And so we see here, for instance, St. Augustine of Hippo, who I think is well known to you all, uh, that the will of God be done in you is one thing, that it be done by you is another thing. For no other reason, therefore, that it may be well for you, do you pray that God's will be done in you. For whether it be well or it will ill with you, it shall be done in you, but may it done also it be done also by you. In other words, no, nothing can thwart God's will. God is omnipotent. And yet, in this gift of freedom, uh, we may freely conform our will to that of God's, and therefore sharing in this life of God's reign, the kingdom. But of course, in sin. And we know from uh, our origins, there has been this rebellion. And so for this coming of the kingdom, there is this need for the conforming of the human will to God, of our uniting ours with the Lord's. And so the kingdom, in a way, is now in the present in Christ because of the victory of Christ in every Christian. Again, I call upon John Cassian here for a quotation. He writes that the kingdom emerges when the rule of the devil has been cast out of our hearts by the annihilation of the foul vices, and God has begun to hold sway in us through the good fragrance of the virtues. When chastity, peace, and humility reign in our minds, and fornication has been conquered, rage overcome, and pride trampled upon. In other words, we can speak of the victory of Christ even now and the presence of the kingdom as it takes place in the individual Christian, conforming his or her will to God's and growing in virtue and likeness of Christ. 
And so again, we also have to look at the uh, fact that yes, it is now the kingdom, but the kingdom is also not yet. We are still waiting for the fulfillment in Christ, the fullness of our salvation in the coming of the kingdom that will come in Christ's second coming. And what will also be the judgment. Here's a striking quote from St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar. Uh, he tells us, at the same time, this must be taken into consideration. That is, when we pray, thy kingdom come. It takes great audacity and a pure conscience to ask for the kingdom of God and not to fear judgment. In other words, when we ask or when we pray, thy kingdom come, make sure we know what we're asking for. Right? Yes, we want the, the kingdom to be present in us now as we grow in the likeness of Christ. But we are also, in fact, praying for the coming of the kingdom in Christ's second coming and in the judgment. Whenever we pray that petition, the fathers is telling, are telling us, Jerome is telling us that we must use that as a reminder for our readiness. Are we prepared for the coming of the kingdom? And are we prepared for that judgment before the Lord that we may share in that joy he offers us? And so that kingdom still to come will is the object of our hope because it will be our liberation, full liberation from sin and death. From one of the earliest, the earliest Latin theologian, Tertullian, uh, in this case in the third century, we hear this. Therefore, if the open manifestation of the Lord's kingdom pertains to the will of God and to our expectation, how could anyone ask for an extension of this world? And the kingdom of God, for whose coming we pray, is directed toward the consummation of this world. We should seek to reign the sooner and not be enslaved the longer. We should not direct our hopes into this world. We, yes, we must grow in virtue. We must grow in our acts of charity and love and certainly follow our Lord's call to uh, seek justice in the world. And yet, at the same time, uh, the fulfillment of creation of our world will only take place in the coming of the kingdom and the coming of Christ. And our hope should always be directed toward that promise that he has given us. Oops. Next, the fulfillment the Alpha and the Omega. Two questions that the fathers ask about the prayer. We, of course, pray, give us this day our, and I said the word is difficult to translate there, daily bread, uh, super substantial bread, bread that is beyond our substance, that nourishes our substance. But what exactly is this bread that we are asking for? What do the fathers tell us? One interpretation that they give is that the bread is the wisdom of God, that is, that which nourishes the divine image within us. The Greek theologian Origen of Alexandria in the third century wrote this, and the bread is that which gives nourishment to true humanity, which is made in the image of God. And so whoever is nourished grows into the likeness of the creator. And what is more precious to the mind of whoever receives it than the wisdom of God? And what is more agreeable to the rational nature than truth? In other words, for origin, this bread that we ask for is in fact the word of God, the wisdom of the scriptures, and the truth who is Christ himself. That we are to grow in meditating upon God's word and seeking to grow in that likeness that we come to know in Christ in the word. This is the bread that nourishes us and we who are made in the divine image that we might grow in the divine likeness. But the fathers also tell us 
that this bread that we seek is the Eucharist, that which we receive in the celebration of the Mass, that which was given to us by the Lord in the Last Supper. Here's a beautiful quote from St. Cyprian of Carthage, whom I mentioned earlier, bishop and martyr. Furthermore, we ask that this bread be given to us daily, lest we who are in Christ and receive the Eucharist daily as the food of salvation, when some more serious fault intervenes, should, while separated and not communicating, be prohibited from the heavenly bread and thus be separated from the body of Christ. And therefore, we ask that our bread, that is, Christ, be given to us daily in order that we who remain and live in Christ might not fall away from his sanctification and body. Our fulfillment, our movement into the omega that is the life of God, is granted to us by the reception of the Eucharist when we receive Christ himself as our food. As he says here, there's even this encouragement to receive daily. And that we, and when we pray the Our Father asking for this bread, should also be reminding ourselves to be always in a state to receive that great gift, that which brings us into the fulfillment of Christ, of God. And so, yes, avoiding sin, uh, not being separated from the body of Christ, such that we might receive the nourishing food that is Christ, the bread of life. Another question that the fathers are asked, and the second question as we look at fulfillment, why are we led into trials? And we pray, lead us not into, and I say trial here, perosmos in Greek, the word there can mean both trial and temptation, a trial or a test. Jesus himself, of course, is led into the desert by the spirit at the beginning of his public ministry in order to undergo test or trial. And so what we are speaking of here then would be those tests or trials in which we are given that opportunity to grow in our faith and our dependence upon God. The fathers emphasize this by noting that to share in Christ's life, we must also share in his cross in his trials. Uh, Here I have a quote from a figure that we only know as the master. Uh, He was a monastic leader in the sixth century, and we have a surviving rule from the anonymous master uh, in Latin. And he writes this, when Christ provided for us the refuge of his cross, the Lord destroyed the sting of death, which was reigning over us. After restoring us to the grace of adoption by him, he has moreover not ceased to invite us to the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it behooves us to share in his sufferings so that we may deserve to be made co-heirs of his glory. Now, we could ask, of course, why are we praying not to share in a way in his sufferings? But keep in mind, uh, really, it is echoing the words of Christ himself in Gethsemane when he asks the Father, that this cup might pass him by, but then not my will, but your will be done. Uh, A reaction toward these trials is natural in us. And yet what we seek in this prayer in the end is to enter into God's, for full conformity to God's will, uh, asking for that grace when we find ourselves in trials, when we are asked to take up the cross. And so, in conjunction with that, we find this prayer to be delivered from evil. That is, that our hope is directed ultimately toward deliverance from sin and death, deliverance from those trials. And so we hear from St. Augustine of Hippo. And we must also pray to be delivered from the evil into which we have been already led. When the deliverance is accomplished, Nothing will be remain to be dreaded, and then there will be no need to fear any temptation, whatever. We conclude that prayer really with the true omega, that hope in the ultimate, the last things, 
in which our full liberation from sin and death will take place in union with Christ and especially in the resurrection when we will be fully united with him. And so I will conclude this brief reading, rapid reading with the fathers by simply pointing out how that image I showed you at the beginning, the prayer as the Alpha and the Omega, pointing us to God as our beginning and our end. Uh, the Master, once again, reminds us, thus may he, Christ, who at the beginning of the prayer shows us that we should dare, by his grace, to call the Lord our Father, Deign now at the end of the prayer to deliver us from evil. Amen. That is our conclusion to the prayer and our daily call that we, our hearts, always rest with him. And it is also the conclusion to this reading with the fathers, a very rapid reading. But I hope that it will open up some further questions from you. And especially, I hope that it will ignite your desire to pray the prayer more fervently, uh, to ask some of the questions that the fathers asked, and I hope to read some of the works of the fathers that you might uh, come to see the prayer, especially through their uh, saintly and uh, very insightful eyes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Father, for that uh, really, really insightful presentation on the Our Father. Uh, as we move down to the question and answer portion of this evening, I just want to remind everybody that at the bottom tab of the uh, sort of Zoom interface, if you will, you'll see the question and answer box. Uh, feel free to uh, continue to bring your questions forward as we begin. Uh, but we do have a question here, Father. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Great. So as you noted at the beginning of your talk, uh, the Our Father is really uh, a profound prayer. Uh, it's something that we Catholics are very familiar with, both from the Mass, from the Rosary, uh, from our personal prayer, as you noted. Um, somebody in this question notes that uh, especially as well, the Our Father is, uh, there's a real power to it in that we pray it in community at the Mass. Um, in the wake of this talk, I think it's awakened in this person uh, sort of a desire to learn more. Do you have any insights as to where they can go to continue to un understand this prayer better and maybe help others uh, kind of grow mm -hmm. in that unity that it engenders? Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing I would recommend in deepening one's prayer and reflection on the Our Father is to go to the scriptures themselves. Uh, you know, something, another thing that uh, St. Cyprian tells us is that the Our Father is in a, a compendium of the gospel, right? Uh, we can find all of the Lord's teachings contained within that prayer. And so reading it and relating it to other portions of the scriptures is something that the fathers regularly do in deepening their understanding. So, for instance, when we simply look at the petition for bread, uh, they look at multiple texts in the scriptures from the manna in the desert to the Christ's bread of life discourse in the Gospel of John. Uh, of course, as I already mentioned, the Last Supper, uh, so many passages within the scriptures to deepen the image that is there and relate it to other teachings and examples that are given to us by Christ. So that's one way I would recommend deepen uh, the reading of the scriptures and coming to know the Our Father in the context of the scriptures. This is what the fathers of the church do. Uh, as I also said, read the fathers themselves. I think they offer wonderful commentaries, and I believe there is a uh, bibliography that I have shared that everyone will have access to, uh, pointing you to where you can find these sources. And I would also say, yes, I think, it's, I think you've mentioned the question, I have to go back, but praying it slowly uh, not letting it become rote. Uh, what I hope happened tonight was, uh, wow, this this more here than we ever thought before, right? I, uh, that, that's what the fathers do. They may suddenly say, wow, there's a lot of strange things I never thought about here. That's meant to happen, right? Uh, it's meant to spark questions in us, to startle us. And sometimes the fact that we've just been doing it over and over again, uh, well, we got to step back sometimes 
pray it slowly, ask the questions prayerfully, uh, and uh, enter into dialogue with, uh, with God in order to find those answers for, uh, for our lives and for our communities. That's very insightful. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, so we have two questions coming in that uh, sort of are uh, very similar. So I'd like to ask them kind of one with the other. The first uh, kind of has to do with the two versions of the Our Father between uh, Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. How do they compare with the original Aramaic version of the Our Father? And then the second question that relates to this would be, uh, how does that word in Greek, that super substantial bread, how is that sort of taken from the Aramaic as well? Mm. The problem is we don't have the original Aramaic. So it's, it's, uh, it's to make a comparison from the Greek, is, a direct comparison is not possible for us. Scholars have tempted to do kind of a reversion of it in which they try to figure out what the Aramaic may have been, what corresponds. And, you know, these are very interesting studies to see what it may have corresponded to. Uh, but the problem is, yes, in some ways uh, doing that can be insightful. On the other hand, we don't know exactly what, uh, what we're dealing with behind it. In the end, the words that we have come to us, the inspired words that we have, come to us in the Greek. So we are dependent on that. Uh, the other question regarding epousios, uh, this is a very interesting word. Uh, origin of Alexandria, whom I mentioned in the presentation in the third century, we can find his commentary on the Our Father portions which I read here in his work on prayer, one of the earliest works on Christian prayer. And of course, he's a native Greek speaker. And in there, he says, we're not really sure what this word means. <laughs> uh, it is unique. And he makes some attempts to liken it to other words in the scriptures. Uh, attempts to translate it, it may come, it's certainly a preposition in Greek, epi, on, upon, above. The other part, it may come from the Greek word to go or come, so coming upon or to come upon, and therefore it's saying something about future, the bread that is to come to us, perhaps pointing us to the coming of Christ. Uh, another possibility for it, uh, it's a pit, and then the word for being or essence, usia. So that which is for the feeding of our true essence, our spiritual lives, the bread that does that, or perhaps the bread that is above or beyond our essence. In other words, pointing perhaps to the Eucharist, uh, to Christ himself. Uh, hence the difficulty in translating that word. And uh, some of the fathers will, will try to grapple with that. Origen himself offers multiple possibilities for it, as I just did. Um, Others uh, are not as attentive to it. In Latin, of course, it depends on the person you're talking about, whether or not he even knows Greek. Uh, Jerome did, and he actually offers the translation super substantial, uh, that which is beyond the essence. Uh, but uh, the word itself is, is mystery and permits multiple interpretations, all which are quite fruitful. Uh, I should say this, that the fathers, when they look at the prayer, they certainly rule out some wrong answers, but they're open to a variety of possibilities and interpretations, uh, even with this single word, because it is God's word and its depths cannot be exhausted. Uh, even now, when we have all these studies of history and, and languages that the fathers didn't have, even now, we cannot exhaust its depths. Epiousios, uh, difficult word to translate, uh, but open to a number of poss possible rich po uh, translations. That is really quite fascinating. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on to another question, uh, 
someone is wondering if you could speak a little bit, maybe perhaps bringing forth the wisdom of the fathers on the part of the Our Father, where we ask to have our sins forgiven as we forgive the sins of our neighbors. Sure. And that petition is an interesting one for the fathers of the church because they noticed something in it that perhaps we don't uh, immediately recognize. Uh, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Notice the way it's phrased. We seem to be asking God to imitate us. Forgive us our trespasses as we do. In other words, God, look at what we're doing and now please do it. It's strange. I mean, uh, you know, it, so are we trying to teach God something or what, what's going on here? Uh, it's, it's, it flips the whole thing. And uh, both Matthew and Luke, even the way it's phrased, have this difficulty. So the fathers try, when they, when they find a problem in the, uh, in the scriptures, that's like a flashing light. It means stop here and meditate and dig in, all right? Uh, it's not like, wow, I will skip that. Uh, but they really try to dig in. When they look at that problem of this seeming, what seems to be a request of of God imitating us in our forgiveness, uh, one interpretation that they give that we'll find a couple of them is uh, is this, that as we grow in the likeness of Christ, in effect, we become a mirror of Christ's own actions, uh, that we in taking on the person of Christ and growing in grace, uh, actually begin to reflect what he calls us and what he does in his own life, calls us to do. And, of course, one of them is forgiveness uh, in the way that he offers the forgiveness of sins. And so, in fact, we, in a way, become a mirror of the divine in our own lives. Uh, So when we're really praying there, that we may more fully take on the life of Christ, that we might reflect the gift of love and forgiveness that he demonstrates. And in turn, then in effect saying, God, look upon us as in your grace, in your gift, we come to reflect the very life, uh, God, speaking to God the Father, the very life of your son. Uh, it's, it's a striking interpretation of that, but also, one that reminds us of our own forgiveness and the fact that in order to forgive sins of our neighbors, uh, we need divine grace. We need to grow in that likeness of Christ that can only be given to us uh, by a share in his life. There's much more that they say, but that's one interesting approach that they take to it. Uh, what a great gift to be able to unpack all of this and to take something that we say so often and really begin to understand it. That's uh, that's remarkable. Or not, under, or yes, at least get some glimpses. Of it. I don't know whether we, like as I said, you can't put it into a box. I mean, they 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 really show us that. They make it explode before us. Certainly. Could you just go over again uh, a little bit more as to how we have divine adoption in our baptism? Sure. Uh, well, of course, we hear in the scriptures themselves from St. Paul that an uh, entrance into baptism is a sharing in the, the death and resurrection of Christ, right? And so the fathers of the church, uh, when they look at this question of how do we dare to call God Father, uh, well, the only way we can do that is because Christ has won this gift for us in his own conquering of sin and death on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. Uh, to the right hand of the Father, drawing our human nature, our life, into the very life of the Trinity. And so our mode of participating in that, the extension of Christ's salvific acts uh, in history, of course, are in the sacraments. And that which gives us that new life, that liberation from original sin, and a share, a participation in the life of Christ is entering into his death and resurrection in the sacrament of baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The uh, fathers of the church, in, in, especially in the, the Greek fathers, called the sacrament of baptism the sacrament of illumination, uh, to enter into that new life, to become an adopted child of God 
of course, is to receive the light of Christ and to see all things in that light. Uh, this is the incredible privilege and gift of one who can call God Father. One other thing I would note here, by the way, uh, a debate uh, among the fathers, some of the fathers of the church was, uh, could one pray the Our Father before getting baptized? In other words, if you were a catechumen preparing for, uh, for baptism, entrance to the church, could you pray the Our Father? Uh, there's a split among the fathers. Some of them will not allow that prayer until after baptism. Others, such as Augustine as an example, uh, St. Peter Chrysologus is another, uh, tell the catechumens very movingly, uh, if you were to die now before you reached uh, baptism, uh, you are already, you know, you already uh, have made this desire to belong to Christ. And so you may pray the Our Father even now. And, and it's, it's really quite, quite striking, and I can imagine incredibly consoling to uh, those catechumens who are preparing for baptism. Uh, but again, it was, it's interesting to find that, that debate among the fathers. But the entrance into that life, that entrance into divine adoption, comes precisely through baptism for them. Certainly. And while we're here on the subject of uh, that divine adoption, calling God our Father, uh, an anonymous attendee has, I think, a pretty interesting question. Um, after that initial uh, sort of assertion of our adoption, the prayer then is a list of petitions. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Uh, as this person puts it, sort of a give me, give me, give me section. Why do you suppose there's no please and thank you uh, built into the Our Father? Mm -hmm. No, it is true. Uh, we look at often scholars today will divide them into we petitions give us, you know, and uh, and the particular petitions. Uh, these. Um, the father, our father consists of petitions for the fathers of the church precisely because in doing so, we are glorifying God and, in fact, giving thanksgiving. That is, uh, on the one hand, we are turning away from ourselves, right, looking to ourselves as gods and placing ourselves fully into our dependence on God. In fact, just take that one petition uh, for bread. Many of the fathers will also interpret that as bread being the basic sustenance of life, that we are to separate ourselves from superfluous things and ask daily just for what we need from God. And in doing so, glorifying God by expressing our desire to depend upon him alone not to look at ourselves as gods. But also within the prayer, we are glorifying God, of course, throughout, as I think that image shows, by asking for fulfillment of God's reign, God's life in us and in creation. Uh, the prayer, in fact, does glorify God in this. Uh, even the deliverance from evil is an expression that desire for that deliverance uh, is an expression that God be all in all. Uh, so in the end, the prayer is, is a beautiful prayer of, uh, of all of humanity and in glorifying God in that dependence and that desire for the fullness of God in uh, creation, that, in that full union. So, uh, yes, I think I think the glorification and the thanksgiving are already present there, and the fathers regularly emphasize this. That's a very good question. Certainly, um, moving moving on as we sort of wrap up here in the last ten minutes, uh, uh, it's a good problem to have, I suppose. There are a lot of questions still coming in, so sorry ahead of time if we are unable to uh, get to yours. Um, but uh, as we think about this prayer, it's it seems to be pretty perfect in terms of all it's able to evoke. Uh, it's why it has such a privileged place in the Catholic tradition. But do you think it can be further perfected, perhaps in our recitation of it? Or, or do you have any thoughts about that more generally? Well, I, I mean, in, in terms of f further perfected, I guess I'm, I'm sure you don't mean adding words to it because I don't think we were to do that. But uh, though it is interesting, uh, the 
uh, one version, very early version of the prayer outside of scriptures we find in a work called the Didache uh, from the first late first century, which is a collection of teachings, really formative teachings for Christians. There's a version of the prayer that concludes with the doxology that we know, glory, all the power and the glory be yours, right? Uh, it, it's present there, but no, uh, I, I assume, I'm sure what you mean, of course, is how can we perfect it in the way that we pray it in our own lives? Again, I made some suggestions earlier uh, in terms of slowing down and really reflecting on the uh, the very each and every word, the richness of each and every word. We just looked at the word "our," right, and what that means, right? Uh, if you look in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, that is the only place where we see "our Father." Everywhere else in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will either speak of my father or your father. When he's speaking about my father, he is talking about his unique relationship to the father. They are of the same nature, right? He is the son. Only he has the privilege of saying my. Whereas we as human beings and adopted can only speak of our father. So he says, your father, right? But reflecting on each and every word, slowing it down, uh, letting the questions arise, right? Uh, when you have a question, as I said, that's a flashpoint for the fathers of the church. It means stop there. Talk about it with God. Do that theology on your knees that is, in fact, prayer deepening that meaning of the, of the Lord's prayer for your life. If you do that on a regular basis, maybe even taking a word or part of it each day, uh, you'll find that your regular recitation of it in the context of the liturgy or the rosary uh, will take on incredible new depths. Uh, again, it's a compendium of the gospel. So I hope that that helps. It absolutely does. And I must say, you know, even, uh, you know, especially as a seminarian, as I continue to grow in my own spiritual life, there's a lot of fruit here to take uh, to uh, to the work we do here at St. John's. Um, as we come up uh, again, as we sort of hit our backdrop, a couple of people have asked, as you mentioned, the doxology that's found in the Didache. Can you describe why that seems to be the typical end of the Our Father in the Protestant tradition, uh, not ours, or... Uh, why we say it at Mass and not in the regular recitation of the Our Father. Can you describe its sort of placement? I couldn't tell you the whole history of how that has worked out liturgically. Um, I mean, certainly it is present in one early version of the uh, prayer, Extra Biblical. Uh, of course, we do say it later in the Mass. It's just not immediately afterwards uh, in the prayers there. But... Uh, I can't tell you uh, actually how that came, how that uh, liturgical difference emerged or in the praying of it. Uh, certainly though, it, it has some ancient roots, so it is not wrong to do so, but then of course uh, it's not immediately coming from the scriptures themselves. Though I would note if uh, in some of the, the, the versions that I showed you, the version that we pray, at least in, in English for instance, is not an exact, uh, translation of either Matthew or Luke. I mean, it draws upon both in many ways. And so uh, the doxology itself, I don't think it's, it's wrong to pray it at the end, though it is interesting. I'd, I'd have to look more into the history there of how that became a, a kind of distinction between Protestants and Catholics. That's interesting. Yeah, certainly fruit for further study for us all. Um, uh, one final question that I might have, I know you said that you were going to put a uh, sort of bibliography together, if you will, yeah. uh, or, or some materials. To, I already to go sent on. it in, so hopefully it's being sent out. I don't know. Perfect. OK, uh, but perhaps I could put you on the spot for maybe one kind of place to start with the, with the church fathers uh if there's some sort of like uh standard kind of introductory work to them that might be good for for anyone out there just kind of interested not only in how the church fathers handle the our father but how they really speak to 
so many issues, theological issues uh, that are that are important to us as Catholics. Sure. I mean, there are many resources for reading the Fathers of the Church. I mean, uh, it, for many of their works in uh, translation, they're actually available online. Uh, so you can find many of them there. But a couple of series I would recommend highly. Uh, there is uh, St. Vladimir's uh, Seminary Press, which is a Eastern uh, Right publishing house, has a series called the Popular Patristic Series. Um, and they're wonderful translations with notes of a variety of fathers of the church. Uh, so I highly recommend those works. And then another series that is incomplete is uh, called The Church's Bible, published by Eerdmans. It's a series of volumes on different uh, books of the Bible, but verse by verse with commentaries, extensive commentaries from the fathers of the church and even uh, some early medieval writers. Uh, is There's only, I think, five volumes available at this point, but it's a wonderful series for entering into the fathers on the scriptures. As for the Our Father itself, uh, in some ways, I would say perhaps the most accessible commentator on it for us uh, Western Latin Rite Catholics uh, would be Augustine, unsurprisingly. Uh, one of the earliest commentaries, it comes from him, that he wrote while still a priest before he became a bishop, which is his uh, work on the Sermon on the Mount. The whole thing is worth reading, but uh, he includes a very uh, wonderful commentary on the Our Father within that, which, of course, in Matthew's Gospel is where it appears. So in some ways, if I had to say, where where should would be a nice place to begin looking at the fathers themselves and the Our Father? Start with Augustine. I think he's. I think uh, everyone knows him, and he's a he's a great entrance ticket. But they're all wonderful. Saint Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Saint Maximus Confessor, Saint uh, Peter Casalis, all wonderful uh, fathers to encounter. So, yeah, thank you so much. And as I said, there will be an annotated bibliography released in a follow up email after the webinar concludes. But uh, thank you for indulging my nerdiness very briefly. Um, but uh, with that, Father, I want to thank you so much for the time you took this, uh, this evening to speak with us uh, about the Our Father, to give us those great insights from uh, the Church Fathers. Uh, thank you for all those participants who, who logged in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this. And uh, should you be interested, our next webinar on February 15th will be a presentation on uh, looking at the Second Vatican Council about 60 years on. Uh, so something to look forward to. Uh, again, thank you so much, Father Gavin. This has been uh, a really wonderful evening. Thank you, Axel. Thank you to the seminary, and thank you for everyone for coming. God bless.